Okay, so um, I was busy thinking to myself when uh, Matteo was presenting that um, it's good that he went first. <clears throat> he did touch on some of the things that I'm going to rant about uh, from the other side of the fence because I'm one of those people who uh, enjoy the technical side of things enough not to want to cross over into um, uh, managing people or taking on a lead role. And sometimes I feel like I'm doing a disservice to myself by uh, staying on the other side because the world can judge me quite harshly. So yeah, let's get into it. So a uh, quick introduction. Uh, so um, a software engineer, I think I've been in the industry for uh, close to 15 years. I didn't always start um, in software development. I started off as a server engineer doing a help desk and that drove me crazy until I picked up on uh, software engineering. I have been around quite a few countries, but uh, only three stand out uh, significantly for my career. I love software development. And one of the things that fascinate me within that space is um, developing for robotics. And I'm yet to get myself into a space where I actually play with a lot of gadgets. Um, I haven't uh, ventured into uh, those kind of spaces, so it's still very much a fascination for me at this point. So what I would like to uh, get in and talk about is um, just a rant uh, around what I think people expect of me as a developer, um, how I have built uh, trust uh, over the years and tried to advance my career. Uh, I'll briefly touch on a few monitoring tools that I have used and I will jump into a ray gun demo and I'll be happy to answer a few questions um, afterwards. Or oh, feel free to interject or oh, in case you don't understand my accent, sometimes I do tend to speak like, like this so that people may struggle to understand me. But if it does get down to those levels, please do let me know so that I can adjust it. So uh, what does it mean uh, to be a developer? I think um, it's a position where you are entrusted with uh, innovation. Uh, you continuously ship things. Um, when I say ship things, I actually mean things that work. Uh, pushing new features, pushing the boundaries. Uh, when you do so, things should remain reliable. And um, there's also a responsibility of performance. Quite often I've seen things that I've pushed out that go there, they work, but they're not as performant as I would uh, like. And there's obviously uh, a connotation around it all uh, about Am I doing things effectively uh, quickly enough? And am I keeping costs at a bare minimum? Through it all, we are supposed to be delivering a uh, great value to our customers, be it internal, external. Uh, so ways in which you uh, deliver great experiences is uh, knowing when things are going wrong before your customers start complaining, um, treating performance as a feature, not as an afterthought, and prioritizing work that will have the biggest impact uh, for the customers. Not every bug uh, has the priority to be fixed. It would be nice to have all bugs fixed, but in practical terms, uh, all software is buggy and some bugs, um, we can just live with them. Uh, they are not a priority for, for our customers. And I, I think the one big point that I want to emphasize on is uh, measure everything, assume nothing. Uh, it's actually one of our uh, Reagan core values. 
And uh, I think one of the places where I have found my greatest strength in advancing my career. And uh, obviously, uh, measuring enables me to communicate uh, complex situations and paint the picture of how much time I will need to uh, fix a bug. And just a disclaimer, please do forgive me. I don't do uh, these sort of things very often and I'm a little bit nervous. So uh, you might pick that my voice is a little bit shaky there. <laughs> So, um, why do we monitor uh, applications or infrastructure or whatever we monitor? I think we monitor so that we can make informed uh, decisions. Particularly for me, I want to stay on top of things. I would hate for my manager to come and tell me that things are going wrong and I have no idea what. So I tend to measure every possible metric that I can. I will be touching on a, a few tools that I have used uh, throughout the years. Uh, sometimes it's passive monitoring where I just collect uh, a bunch of logs using uh, either Log4Net and uh, having those logs indexed in either Greylog or Splunk. In some cases, it's custom metrics that I stream to another service like uh, Datadog. And then there is some monitoring that you can also put in place to tell you how your application is faring out there in the world, uh, like a new relic, which is the space that uh, Reagan also finds itself. And uh, maybe uh, Google Analytics, Azure Insights, Firebase, the list is uh, just long and endless. One of the reasons why um, I tend to measure every possible metric that I can is so that I have real-time visibility into the uh, experience that the customers are having out there, which is basically how well our brand is faring. Uh, the bottom line for wanting to monitor everything is I may not be in front of uh, the customers all the time, but I must play my part in uh, customer retention. I'm born in an era where I'm defined as a uh, millennial and one of the prevalent things that I have sort of noticed with people in my age group is we tend to epitomize uh, ADHD. So if I find that a particular service is not captivating enough, I simply move on. Um, I don't pick up the phone to call the company to complain about uh, ABCD. So if our customers are not telling us that they are having a bad experience, how do we know that the experience is bad to start off with? Uh, and I think there is also a part that I play in trying to uh, minimize the cognitive dissonance where some of the products that we might put out there might give our customers a feeling of uh, conflict. They want to hold on to the money, but they know they need the monitoring tool or they want whatever service, but there's also that uh, internal conflict that they want to hold on to uh, their perceived uh, value. So um, if my application is not going to be performant enough, I am not going to be able to break through that barrier of uh, that internal conflict that people often find themselves in. Like I said, um, wanting to give a rant about my experiences and uh, advocate for monitoring. There is really nothing new that I'm going to talk about here. It's probably stuff that you've all heard about, but I think my rant will put an emphasis on um, the need for monitoring. And I am not 
trying to push uh, any particular brand. And I know I'm working for Egg and I should be wearing my sales cap, but I'm not going to do a one size fits all. So uh, I'll jump into one of the worst horror stories of my life. So I worked for a company that I'll not mention uh, where the development had been carried out by uh, a team in Vietnam. And uh, this consulting company is mainly a code minting uh, factory. And sometimes during my tenure in that company, I asked myself whether these people really cared about the product or they were mainly focusing on just training um, features out. And one of the things that I struggled with uh, with the code base was the usage of uh, link to SQL. Uh, the data context was all over the show. Uh, including in some views where uh, people wanted or the application needed to display uh, a particular value instead of uh, putting things in a structured way. I found uh, a data context being called from a view to pull out a value to, uh, to display on the screen. The other thing that I also struggle with uh, in my career has been the usage of uh, object relational mappers I love them because of the convenience they bring. But when you are dealing with very large data sets, it is very difficult to diagnose bugs and you know, drill down to those performance bottlenecks because most of the time the application continues to run, it doesn't throw an error, and you have no insights into uh, the kind of bottlenecks that you had. Which brings me to my... Uh, 9 a.m. bug, that wasn't a bug. <laughs> so for the first six months uh, in this uh, job that I had taken up, we had a persistent bug that manifested itself at 9 a.m. without fail every day, unless it was uh, school holidays. So the other thing with uh, this company was um, the responsibility of maintaining the databases was far removed from the developer, which in itself uh, should have raised uh, red flags for me. So what you see there is a diagram, uh, which I believe is a standard way that um, any software developer would structure their tables uh, where there is a many-to-many -many relationship uh, between tables or between uh, the anomalized data. So um, I don't know if you can see my mouse moving. So what was happening uh, with this particular feature of the application is that uh, every day at nine, the schools would do and mark their attendance. This would have been okay if the school, if it was just maybe one school uh, with uh, a couple of classes and maybe up to a thousand students, we wouldn't have picked up on uh, this being a bottleneck. But because this application was um, cloud-based and being used by almost 4,000 schools, averaging uh, 60 odd classes per school and around about a thousand students uh, in the school. We had our peak, uh, peak period at 9 a.m. when school starts. And this application was very slow and quite often, uh, because it was running on uh, Windows servers, we started getting uh, Win32 errors that were not even descriptive of what was going on. So to try and ease off things, we started fanning out uh, our web farm, thinking the Win32 errors were coming from uh, one of the servers. 
eventually it turned out that the Win32 errors were actually emanating from uh, the database side of things. Because the database was far removed from um, our control, I had no insights into uh, what type of partitioning or indexes had been applied on these tables. And uh, the company that was uh, managing the databases for us uh, had put us on the lowest tier for their support, meaning uh, they did very little monitoring on the performance of the databases. So I decided to go in and uh, put and sure enough, after six months of trying all sorts of uh, things at uh, several uh, meetings of uh, my competency coming into question, I then started pinning down uh, my suspicions on the database. And eventually, um, managed to convince my manager to let us manage our own database and as soon as i looked at it i realized the database had been running for almost uh eight years without any of its data being archived uh there was only one index on the attendance table which was uh the surrogate uh primary key the other foreign keys, I think they are naturally indexed by the uh, database, but this table had grown over 12 gigabytes. And because it was doing sequential scans, um, everything in that table was extremely slow. So if you put all that together with uh, the peak period at 9 a.m., uh, the connections to that database would just start timing out uh, queries become slow, and um, that's where the Win32 errors were uh, coming from. So during one uh, of the sessions when we were doing this, I decided I needed uh, a tool that looked a little bit deeper into the code. Uh, and the funny story about that is I found Reagan, and I tried out their uh, APM product. And uh, while I was trying out their APM product, uh, my manager had said uh, something about my competence and why he regretted uh, hiring me and wished I would go back to Africa. Nasty. But um, while I was doing that investigation, I stumbled upon uh, Reagan's uh, careers page and I dropped an application and <laughs> I'm here today. <laughs> uh, so the solution for me there was, after I, I discovered what was going on, I firstly partitioned um, the table uh, by year. That improved things a bit, but after investigating the data, I realized most of the data could be condensed. We didn't need to uh, keep uh, these uh, codes for every uh, single time uh, a student attended a, a class. So we ended up uh, breaking down the tables and introduced uh, an attendance header. So if most of the students in that class were in attendance uh, of the class, they uh, are explicitly in the database, but just grouped them together with um, the class. So if the majority of the students were present for that day, they got a code P. So having uh, the date stamp uh, or the timestamp entry in the attendance header and the majority attendance code P, uh, by default, it marked everyone is present unless the student was absent or they had another attendance code they, that needed to be applied uh, against them. They would then get the attendance exception record. 
So after running the uh, condensation of the data, I managed to shrink um, a table that was 10 terabytes down to just under 500 meg. And that greatly improved the performance um, of, of the application. Another example uh, that I can give was um, I was I, I did some work for uh, a media company in South Africa, and some of our users are in uh, remote places, and there was an SLA uh, in one of the projects that we were doing that all pages must be loaded within uh six seconds and um the graphs that you see here i uh, adopted from um the reagan uh, ram uh, pages but uh the people in the remote areas had uh, very poor connections and we were trying to push uh, down these uh, feature-rich, uh, heavy pages. And um, just through tracking those metrics, uh, what it would have looked like uh, using this sort of graph was the majority of the users were getting uh, very high load times. And uh, through tracking those metrics and uh, using some of the uh, cloud features to determine uh, where a user is physically located. We managed to put out a few more uh, data centers out that were closer to people so that uh, we reduced the latency. And then for those hopeless ones in areas where they were probably relying on a satellite connection, uh, the trick that I came up with was to just reduce the number of assets we were pushing down to those pages. Again, um, this was a big responsibility on my head. And without taking a look at those metrics and measuring them over time to get the trends, I wouldn't have been able to migrate the majority of those users from those uh, big load times down to uh, some performance pages. Now that I'm working for Reagan, I absolutely love uh, using uh, the, 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 the RAM uh, tool because from the onset, if you have been running your pages with uh, the RAM product for a, for a couple of days, you can already begin seeing these sort of trends and um, it, it just gives you a, a good insight into uh, possibly what needs to change almost instantly. One of the questions I asked when I was looking at the graphs was, uh, why are we using uh, a bar chart instead? Why not a pie chart? Why not something else? And the example to justify bar graphs that I was given was, if Bill gets where to walk into a Starbucks, on average, everybody is a, a millionaire or possibly a billionaire. But if you use a bar graph to uh, show the distribution of your data, you will always have, you know, Bill gets sitting out there. So I think that example uh, does apply uh, relevantly when you are looking at uh, data like this. For me these days, when I look at the bar graph, I'm not very much concerned about people sitting in this sort of group, but I'm more interested in why that outlier is there. If that outlier were green, possibly I wouldn't mind very much, but the standard here is, you know, red represents uh, something that needs attention. And I would focus my efforts on uh, maybe bringing that outlier back into, uh, into the green zone. 
So it doesn't matter which narrative um, you have uh, for, for your business, why you should have interest in that outlier. For me, it just boils down to someone is having a bad day with the service that I'm trying to provide. Uh, one of the proudest moments uh, that stands out for me is one of the projects that I'm uh, working uh, on currently here at Reagan. We've got um, data that we receive uh, from uh, our customers and that, does some, that data is distributed across, uh, I think, 32 nodes. And um, each of those databases is approaching, I think, five terabytes. And it, it's becoming a nightmare to efficiently run queries uh, on, on those databases. So one of the innovative ways we have come up with was to uh, migrate some of the older data into S3 storage. But given the pressure that is already on the databases, I was faced with a challenge where the application that I developed uh, would run queries for uh, anything from 500 milliseconds to, sorry for me. Sorry about that. So the application that I'm working on was running uh, these long running queries that I could not um, figure out how to get around. And uh, the queries initially were running from anything from 500 milliseconds to about um, six hours, depending on how I had joined um, the, 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 the tables. And some of the data was running uh, sequential scans, which I extremely so. One of the things I decided to do, one of the things that I decided to do was uh, to deliberately add in some uh, logging within the application, and I began to see that. Although I was writing standard queries with uh, inner joins or left joins, those joins were what was actually slowing me down. So I started uh, writing uh, my queries in batches and sending uh, a batch to the database execute, come back if I need to enrich the data, write another small query that goes and execute quickly and come back out. So I was able to drive those um, queries down from a uh, couple of hours for some of the bigger databases uh, and from 500 milliseconds for the smaller ones, right down to uh, 50 milliseconds uh, for, for each query. And this has been consistently running for the past few weeks. One of the challenges was, uh, the cost on the database has been uh, memory. So running those queries was extremely fast, but I had a severe memory drain where running it for 10 minutes would potentially pull down uh, a couple of the databases and render them inaccessible because of the swap rate that has gone up and the database can no longer keep up with the pressure. And I came up with, um, ways of monitoring uh, those. That's the graph that you're looking at there. Uh, I know Datadog uh, says this is the anti-pattern uh, way of uh, distributing or uh, having a look at what's going on on your graphs. But what I was really interested in was uh, those spikes that uh, stand out and um, that enabled me to really zone in on what was going on and um, come up with uh, ways to do this kind of ways. So now I have an application that seems uh, that I 
instances. Traditionally, we would have had 20 odd instances of this application running across all the databases, siphoning the data out and pushing it into uh, S3 buckets. I was able to keep up with the amount of work that needs to happen running uh, a .NET Core 3.1 uh, application on a Linux box. And uh, this, it works amazingly. It pushes a lot of data out of all those databases, just a single instance of the application running all 32 nodes. So uh, what am I saying about uh, monitoring? You need visibility into uh, the application that you are, you have interest in. You need visibility into the customer experience, be it internal, external. Uh, for me, monitoring is meant to uh, it, it's it's not a firefighting tool. It's a tool that enables me to push boundaries uh, where possible. In this example, this application has not been commissioned yet, but I have been able to fine tune it by deliberately monitoring. And I am not prescribing any tools. Um, you can use any tool that you fancy to uh, monitor. We as Reagan are out there uh, to also play our part in uh, providing uh, that ability for you to monitor your applications. One of the things that I like uh, about uh, the tools that I'm, and I'll keep talking about Reagan because I am dog fooding the monitoring. If I'm having a bad experience with Reagan, so are my customers out there. So one of the things that I love uh, about uh, the Ragan suite of applications is with crash reporting, if you have your deployments enabled, you can actually correlate your application failures to particular deployments. And um, for the monitoring, for uh, the APM, you can actually pinpoint which development or which deployment uh, is problematic. Something I think in my past wouldn't have been possible uh, because we don't always have that consciousness to say it's this develop, uh, it's this deployment that we put out last week that's causing issues or maybe a problem started a couple of weeks back and went unnoticed and it's only surfaced now because we've added something onto it that makes it more pronounced. Um, so just to touch on a few um, tools that I have used, uh, Greylog and Splunk, they're great for indexing your logs, uh, taking a look at, uh, well, sifting through a ton of logs to easily find uh, some problems. Uh, I have used New Relic, and uh, if I were to describe New Relic uh, for me, for at the time I was using it, it was offering me periodic samples uh, and you know some poultry information, and you know you called this method so many times. It was great at the time, but with the kind of monitoring that I need now, I need something that gives me a, more than just a, a cold tree information. I want to drill down onto a method level uh, or even down to a query level uh, granularity what's uh, going on just uh, data dog i use a subset of their tooling uh mainly uh to check my uh custom metrics um i understand they've got other great offerings 
but like I said, I am mainly dog fooding Reagan. So um, it's only the tooling that we don't provide ourselves that I tend to look uh, for external providers. Google Analytics, I, I, I love Google Analytics. I think they are one of the market leaders when it comes to uh, real user monitoring, but their narrative is geared more toward um, uh, marketing than it is uh, for us developers to push the envelope on uh, what we want to uh, ship out there. And then that brings me to uh, Reagan. So I think in a way, when it comes to application performance monitoring uh, and user uh, experience monitoring, Reagan gives me a holistic picture, um, particularly if you have uh, an integration of all three products in one. What I have here in the uh, image is a dashboard uh, that uh, is produced. Oh, well, you can move up the, the widgets around, but this is one of the dashboards that we uh, use at Reagan. Uh, the map there shows me where my active users are within RAM, and some of uh, the graphs here are showing me <coughs> traces uh, from the APM tool. So um, does anyone have a question before I jump into the uh, brief demo? Okay. Um, I'm going to rush through this. I have a school run that I'm supposed to do and that's the wife calling. So please do forgive me for that. <clears throat> so I am going to jump into uh, Reagan and I am going to show you around um, just a little bit. So you might recognize this graph from uh, earlier. It's uh, one of our um, real user monitoring tools. So we the website live and uh, we track it using um, the Reagan suit of products. So <clears throat> let me start off in uh, the crash reporting space. So this is what the uh, crash reporting uh, space looks like. I currently, oh yes, deployments is enabled, but for the time frame that's shown on this screen, uh, there are currently no recent uh, deployments that happened in here. Um, this has already aggregated my errors. I already know if it's an error that is um has been persistent for a year i mean for a long time or it's something new <coughs> i tend to focus my efforts on uh new errors because i know that's something that got recently introduced and i quite like to do uh something about those errors whilst the memory of what's causing them is still fresh in my mind and this is a great way of showing uh, what's new, uh, what's really old, what we don't care about. If I honestly do not care about something, I can uh, quite easily mark it as, you know, ignore permanently and um, that sort of thing 
it will continue to happen, but it's one of those examples where it's a small bug. It's not in a critical path for us to fix, and I can simply turn it off. Whereas if I were using um, tools like Greylog or Splunk, you know, there'll be thousands of those things that I don't care about. Just uh, a lot of chaff in trying to find uh, one small needle in, 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 in that huge pile of chaff. Um, and Andre, please feel free to jump in if I'm not doing justice to, uh, <laughs> to, to, the, to the products here. Um, one of the features that uh, really, I really find attractive in uh, the Reagan suite of products is you can have an integration with your, uh, with your repositories, what do you call it? Version control systems. Uh, that was escaping me a little bit. And with that sort of integration, I can't see where this is leading me here. One of the great things about that integration is if there is a crash, it can point me directly to the line of code uh, where that crash has happened. And I'm trying to find an example of uh, that in this one crash here. Let me pick something else. Right, I'm not able to locate one of those errors that point me straight to uh, the line of code that I'm uh, interested in. So uh, I'll quickly rush through to uh, <clears throat> is do forgive me for uh, rushing through. So with real user monitoring, there is this um, general page which shows you the general performance of your application. Uh, what the P99 means is that 10% that's really having a hard time using uh, my, my application out there. And for me, it's, uh, it, it, it's a focus area that I'm uh, really interested in. Um, the pages are categorized with um, the, the most popular. Uh, again, if I were providing a service, I would want the stuff that everybody is using to be really performant. So I'm just going to jump into one of those uh, popular pages. And like I said, the that's really So if I were looking at um, other metrics and sifting through logs, this wouldn't be readily uh, be apparent, but using this tool, I am able to jump in there and focus on firstly, who is having uh, a difficult time, where are they, and what sort of device are, are, are they using. And if I take a, a further deep dive into one particular session, if there were exceptions occurring with this user, they would be uh, listed down here. And I am able to also see the journey that that user has gone through to get to the point where they were. Maybe my application has got a strict workflow and for some reason somebody has a way of tricking the application into uh, a, a way that deviates from the workflow. Um, you would be able to see the full journey here. And unfortunately for this uh, one user we are looking at here that had a poor experience, they only visited one page and most probably dropped off because the experience was poor. So this becomes uh, a place for me to focus my, uh, my attentions. 
And just clicking through um, that page, I am able to see uh, more information about um, why that experience was, uh, was very poor and how often this one user has uh, been to this uh, particular place and having that um, experience. I am going to jump into the So this is a very busy graph. What I tend to have my interest in within the APM product is uh, the traces and uh, jumping straight into the uh, flame chart. Like I alluded to earlier, I'm more interested in the detail of what's actually going on with my application. So in this um, view that we have here, I've got a flame chart that shows me the cold tree right down to uh, the SQL query that was running against my uh, database. And if I can relate this to the earlier story I told you about the 9 a.m. bug, we were using an object relational mapper and I think I had to up to about a thousand uh, SQL queries, which is what Reagan defines as uh, those n plus one queries. It means you've got an object graph uh, for each property on that object graph you are reaching out to the database to populate its properties. <clears throat> and maybe it's just geared uh, toward displaying just one value on the screen. But for you to get that value, you have to use uh, your ORM, which goes and perform uh, all these unnecessary queries. And <clears throat> to be honest, when I fixed that problem and because I changed the underlying data structure, that forced me to also provide just one SQL query to go and populate that data. And that's where some of the performance gains come from. So when you don't have this sort of thing uh, readily available to you to make that decision of, is it something we can ignore? Do we need an architectural change or do we just need to optimize the database? I, I think my life as a developer would be uh, very, very difficult. Uh, without any further ado, uh, and because I'm pressed for time, I am going to stop here and facilitate uh, a few questions before I run out. Thank you.